Welcome to the Ultimate Athlete Podcast, where we help you look, move, and feel like an athlete. In today's episode, I'm talking with two-time Olympian Hector Cotto. Hector is a Puerto Rican Olympic athlete specializing in the 110-meter hurdles. He competed in the Beijing Olympics in 2008 and the London Games in 2012. He also competed in the World Athletic Championships for multiple years running. I was fortunate enough to train with Hector side by side during a year long intensive mentorship that I did with his coach. When Hector went to the track, I went too. When he went to the gym, I was there. When he went to the physical therapist, I drove him there. This 24 7 insider's look at the life and training of an Olympic athlete opened my eyes to the sacrifice and the discipline that it takes to be an Olympian. As Hector says in today's interview, to be the best, you have to be willing to die every day on the track. Today, I want to share with you exactly how Hector became the best. First as a college athlete, then at the national level, and finally on the world stage. How did he train? How did he eat? How did he recover? What was his mindset? Hector reveals all of this and more in today's incredible conversation. So without further ado, please help me welcome two-time Olympic athlete, Hector Cody. All right, good. Hector Cotto, welcome to the podcast. I wanted to jump right in and ask you a couple questions. Basically, the intention of this podcast is to share what an average guy who's looking to get stronger, faster, become a better athlete can learn from someone who's competed at the highest level. And you being a two-time Olympian, have competed at the highest level. And so I was hoping you could start with just telling us a little bit about the backstory. Like in a nutshell, how did you even become an Olympian? All right, Shane, thanks for having me. It's been a long time. My, my career in track almost kind of started when I met you back in 2008. I graduated from college. I transferred as a football player, right? Because in high school, my obsession was NFL. NFL, oh, I want to go to the NFL. And then I didn't do enough on a football field to really merit, you know, going to Notre Dame or something like that. But I, I ran fast enough on the track to get the football coaches thinking that I deserve a chance because I got all this speed. And so I picked up a little Division II football scholarship off of my track credentials, honestly. And then I got to Fayetteville State University here in North Carolina. And, you know, it kind of like reality kind of sunk in. I was like, whoa, there's so much competition. This is the Division II level and it's still just competition through the roof. And um, I didn't see myself gaining the weight. I'm still skinny now. And um, I didn't see myself gaining the, the weight and the strength needed to really compete in the NFL. And so I transferred to East Carolina. And I said, you know what? I was pretty good at the hurdles. Let me give the hurdles another shot. I did good enough there to break the school record to set it at East Carolina. And so now that was 2006. 2007... I don't have an athletic scholarship anymore, so they put me on fifth-year aid. I'm still at East Carolina, still getting my degree, and I'm still, you know, around the track team. And it's now the 2008 coming up, and the Olympic standard is only one-tenth faster than what I had already run in college. And so I decided that, you know, I think I can, I can hit that standard. And um, I graduated in December of 2007, and I got a job in Boston. All right. And so that's what I moved to Boston for. That's when I met you. And while there, we had a website back in the day called trackshark.com. So I was, in, I knew I needed a coach and I reached out on trackshark.com. Hey, does anybody know anybody in the Boston area that can, um, I can link up with and train? And that's when I met Carl Valley. And then Carl Valley, you know, took me in and got me in shape. And we went out there and we did what we had to do. And um, that's really where it started. It wasn't even like, oh, I have this dream since I'm a little kid to run professional hurdles because most in track and field, that's not usually how it worked. I had football dreams. I had all this speed. It turns out I was way hurdles than I was ever going to be at playing wide receiver. And so, you know, I've always felt like I was kind of meant to run the hurdles, you know, because it, it worked out for me even though I was almost trying to avoid it, you know, like trying to football, 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 and bro, football's not for you. And so transferred, got the scholarship. When I broke the record, I was like, dang, I guess I'm pretty good at this. And so I just kept right on going there. 
But um, it was by by accident or by fate, I guess. But um, yeah, not on purpose. Gotcha. That's cool. And I'm curious, like, it sounds like you had a background playing football, playing football. athletics. When you started training, like, to, to try to compete in the Olympics, what did you notice was different about training to be an Olympian versus just training to be like a guy who wants to be in shape, be a little bit athletic? Like, how is Olympic athlete training different than just regular Joe training? Well, I guess, you know, you got certain standards that you have to meet when you're trying to compete athletically. So the plan required is through the roof. The amount of work that it takes, because I don't know, if you're just training to be a regular, you know, you know, play basketball on the weekends and go to the beach and look good, you know, you can just put in a few hours in the gym and, you know, be all about the physique of things. And that works out. But when athletics, like it can't just be bench pressing for the sake of bench pressing. Like that, that has to serve a purpose. And so one of the biggest differences <laughs> is for athletic improvement, you need to obsess over exercises like hip thrust, exercises like power cleans, med ball throws, you know, Olympic, Olympic movements. And an everyday guy is just about bench and squat primarily. Bench, squat, lat pulls, curls, like you're a professional sprinter at least, you're not gonna be doing curls and tricep extensions, like that's not even, that's like at the tail end, kind of like coach puts it in there so you kind of feel good about yourself. But, you know, curling doesn't really serve a purpose for helping me sprint faster. And so, you know, the discipline required obviously is through the roof, but really it's the way that you look at the training. It's not about getting bigger in track and field. You would actually like to slim down while increasing your strength at the same time, that would be ideal. If I could weigh 112 pounds and squat 500 pounds, I would weigh 112 pounds and squat 100 pounds. All right. And so that, you know, mentality shift is real important once, you know, if you do decide that you're going after a performance and results rather than just out there to look good in the gym. Mm -hmm. So that's really going to be the biggest, the biggest difference. It's just, it's, just, it's way harder. I mean, like, there's, there's, there's no comparing it, really. You can really only compare to gym, right? Because everybody, you know, lift, lifts weights. We do it different, but what really makes a sprinter a sprinter is the sprint work, all right? And so in all of my years of training, when I actually had success, it was because of the sprint work that I was in. It wasn't because of the hurdle workouts. And it wasn't because of the um, strength and conditioning. All those things help, but... In order to run faster, say you're an 11 flat kid, you want to go 10 five. You got to legit die on the track. That's what I tell all my app every day. You got to die on the track. So there are, we'll say five people that line up on any given run. Let's say we're going to run 200 or 300. You got to win every one. It's that simple. Like that's, that's the mentality that it takes to actually, you know, go above and beyond what everybody else is doing. Everybody's showing up to practice. Everybody's doing the same workouts, same recovery. We've got the same coaches. So why do some succeed while others don't? It's because most, I'll say 80%, on a college track team just show up to get the workout done. That's it. And then conference comes and their season is over with because they're not moving past conference because they weren't in practice dying, right? And so that really, that mental shift is important. And that's really going to be the distinguishing thing. Like if you're just, if I'm just working out to have a, you know, a summer body, you know, I don't got to die and wait them every day, you know, but if I'm training to compete at Olympic games or world championships or win a national championships, I do have to die every day. And in the seasons in which you decide, ah, this was good enough. It's not good enough. As soon as you're in practice, thinking we have five, 200, I ran wall, okay, on, on decent time, coach was happy with it. That's not good enough. You legit got to be dead on the fourth one, thinking you can't make the fifth one, but you're in such good shape that you do make it. But that fear 
of not being able to make it because you've already used all your energy. And that's, that's really the issue. Um, that, you know, even some great high school athletes, they were just naturally great. They get to the college level. Why don't they continue to stand out? It's because now all of a sudden, they're just going through the motions. Showing up to practice like 80%, but it's that 20% that goes above and beyond that really gets the results. And that's the real difference between just, uh, you know, average Joe, I'm going to do five sets of bench and then incline and then some push-ups and then some lat pulls. Whereas with us, it's um, I'm going to do the bench press until I can't bar off my chest anymore. That will be the equivalence of what you do with your legs. Because by the last rep, it should be like you can't walk. And that's really the, 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 the difference. And doing it for yourself, for looking good, you can take it easy. And doing it for results, you can't take it easy. And you're constantly having to really push yourself to death. Because I, I don't know what death feels like, but it has to feel something like, you know, being on the ground, feeling like you can't stand back up so that, that's the difference man it's just you it's monk mode that's what coach carl valley used to um call it like when you decide that it's time to get serious and time to compete you're in monk mode and that's where the discipline goes through the roof and that's where it's no longer about the look of things but what are we getting out of every single movement that we do yeah that's brilliant there's so many gold nuggets in there that the average guy could could take to improve their own training whether they plan on being the best athlete or just better than they are now there's a couple of things that you mentioned that i wanted to highlight one of them being competition you said like dying on the track like the average guy is just competing yeah. against himself if he doesn't really give it his all no one sees it no one knows and so he's going to have you know okay results he's going to be healthy he's going to have mediocre results but if he wants to take it to the next level, if he can somehow add in some competition and some specific standards that he has to live up to, he's going to push mm -hmm. harder. And I can give a silly example from my own life. I live here in Colombia. I just discovered that there's an ultimate Frisbee group. I haven't competed in any athletics for a while. I've been just the, you know, exercising for health and longevity and just, you know, being a healthy guy, lifting weights, stretching, doing my mobility work, jogging. But when I discovered that there's a group and I started competing with this group of people in ultimate Frisbee, that competitive drive came out, came, came out in me again. And I started mm -hmm. taking all of my training way more seriously. I'm doing sprint drills again, and I'm sprinting and I'm doing agility training and it's all at a much higher intensity. Um, yep. so I think that's really brilliant. If you can put yourself in a team environment where you're competing, trying to go for standards, that's going to definitely take you to the next level. It brings up, uh, sort of the other side of the coin for me, which is. Obviously, we've all seen examples of people who push hard all the time and they burn out or get injured. And so I'm curious yeah. how you push it so hard where you're redlining the vehicle, you're trying to win all of the 400s that you're running against people, you're trying to outlift mm -hmm. people. How do you avoid getting hurt? Yeah, so that is important. That's overtraining. And that really, you know, there's theories and, you know, you can get into all the science and stuff. But it comes down to trial and error because so I coach youth athletes and I coach high school athletes and sometimes I coach college athletes. And if it's your first year training, you've never done any kind of athletic work before, your body's probably only going to handle two weeks of real hard work before it starts breaking down on the third week. But then after you had a few years of training, you can actually go three hard weeks of training before it starts breaking out in that fourth week. And so, you know, a good coach is going to schedule in rest period. And so that's why you do, you know, you're scheduling in week, weekly cycles, four weeks, five weeks. At the end of my career, we were doing seven week cycles. That's because I was in shape to handle seven weeks. And we knew that throughout the years, you know, after five weeks, I still got energy to go. But you're always pushing until you're about to break and you really don't learn until you've been with the same coach for a while and he knows that, all right, five weeks is too much. So we're going to have to go four weeks. And so it's really trial and error, but you know, that's a part of it. And that that's important because with the mental side, some athletes, especially younger athletes don't understand that, you know, you're going to reach a point in which the results get worse. So say you started at hundred 
On day two, you're going to go down to 99. By the end of week one, you're down to 90, right? And so what you're going to do is you're going to keep pushing that. And so by the end of week two, let's say we're down to 80. By the end of week three, we're down to 70. And then week four, we have this rest week where on purpose, we're taking everything easy, 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 easy. And now we're climbing back up. And so where we start on the fifth week, we're at 101, which is higher than we've ever been before. And that's the whole process. But it's, it's trial and error because you can sit here and say it's four weeks and then you put 10 athletes through the same system, give them burnout in two weeks and then the rest of them are going strong and it's because there's no one size fits all, right? Those two athletes have a different history, different genetic makeup. And so, you know, you're going to have to take a little more time to see, you know, where is it that this athlete literally plateaus? It's when you get to the point where the results are just like noticeably worse. All right, you've reached that, you've reached that breaking point where now it's time to rest. And then you take that rest and now it's like better than ever. And when you're young and you don't know these things, you know, your brain is just going everywhere because you hit that point. And you're like, oh, she doesn't know what he's doing. Terrible, this, that, and the other. And it's because you don't realize it. That's the way the whole training um, cycles go. And, but um, it's important to um, schedule in the rest and it really just comes down to, to trial and error, all right? Push, push, push. I say you keep working hard until you're at a point where you're gonna get injured or you do get injured. And now you've learned, and hopefully it's not some humongous injury, something minor, okay. And now going forward, we look back, how many weeks did it take us to get there? Okay, this is about his threshold. And then maybe next year to be a little uh, greater. But that's, that's how it works there. Yeah. What you're pointing out is smart planning and smart periodization and individualization, knowing how much a certain athlete can tolerate and planning their mm-hmm. overall schedule in an intelligent way, which as you said, a beginner might not know how to do. And that's why working with a good coach such as yourself um, can be very helpful. And I, I do, I, I'm totally in agreement with you that managing sort of the training volumes and the intensities and just how much work you're doing and how hard is that work is the most important thing. When you have found yourself injured or tweaked or a little off, I remember your coach, Carl, and my mentor um, used to send you to say, get some tissue work done or go see the, uh-huh. the physical therapist to, you know, work on some alignment issues or how the foot is moving or, you know, the tissue quality. He would often have you doing foam rolling and stretching after your workout to kind of help a little bit in the recovery process. Can you speak a little bit about outside help from therapists and healers and also the, the stretching and self-massage that you might do to help recover like an athlete? Now, so when it comes to that, it's really about who you're working with. Because what I have come to learn is that all, that all chiropractors are not created equal. All physios are not created equal. You can go to one and he's got the credentials, graduated from this school and that, and you're not getting results and you're still injured. And now you've been to him for two months and it's like, what's really going on? And then you go to somebody else who in a single session really fixes you up and it's like, wow. So, you know, when it comes to the outside help, like you, it's, it's tough, man, because you really got to work with somebody that has been like working with athletes. Because our injuries are going to be a little different and our recovery rates are going to be a little different as well. And um, most times, you know, the, the, one of the best that I worked with was um, Marchese. And that's who Carl was taking me to in Boston there. Right. And that's that's what opened my eyes to it, because I used to go to another chiropractor when I was younger and it would just be crack your back and, and kick you out. That was 100 percent all he ever did. 100 percent and then i went to marchese same thing right physio director and i and laying on the table and i'm doing it. he's walking he's measuring and then he's taking this thing to my shin and doing all this work and it's like wow this is a this is a real doctor who's like really trying to help whereas now it clicked to me the other guy was just getting people through the door to get more money right and so it's really important you know, when you get that outside help, you know, that comes down to trial and error too. But um, I say when you find a good doctor, like, you know, almost immediately. 
So if you if you if you got to go to the same doctor four times in a row before you're like, okay, I'm feeling better, then it's probably not probably not the right one. But as far as um, foam rolling and all that, that's all very 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 important to keep your body kind of like up, right? So like what I was saying earlier, you start at 100 at the end of week one, you're down to 90, then 80, then 70. Foam rolling and massaging and ice baths and getting you know going to the physio maybe once or twice in that little week period that helps keep you up so if you were from 100 to 90 that might bring you back up to 92 right and then next week you would have plummeted to 80 you climbed up to 84 and then the next week would have been 70 you're at 76 because you've been doing those things but when it comes to serious injuries this is just you know my experience nothing helps like rest nothing 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 at the end of my career I suffered um, Achilles tendonitis, and it was so incredibly painful for so many years. First, it was my left one, and towards the end, my right one started suffering too. And so, you know, I'm a hurdler. I need my Achilles to be able to bounce off that track. And we did stem and laser, and they put injections, and we did all these rehab exercises, and none of it worked. Like, if the pain got to 100, all of that worked would bring it down to like an 85 and then it'll be right back up to hundred and then bring it down to 85 with all of that work. None of it ever really, really, really cured it. And then I stopped running. I take an extended break from athletics. I come back and I don't even remember that I had Achilles pain. Right. And I wasn't doing all this fancy, none of that. I was doing and allowing my body to rest. And in my entire career, Nothing has ever cured pain, any kind of injury, more so than just resting. Obviously, you can't do that in season, right? But when it comes to these serious injuries, if you don't got to compete for months, then really the number one thing you could ever do is just to take time off, lay in bed, lay on the sofa, don't do anything. Let your body just recoup energy. And it will do wonders. It will do wonders. Like today, I don't have a Achilles pain. And at one point, you know, it was like every day I felt like today's a day. It's just going to rupture. It's just going to rupture. And, it, and, and, and the pain went on for years, right? From 2011 to 2014, three years I dealt with pain. It was just so bad. And today, you know, it's almost like I, I couldn't remember what it felt like. I can, but, and that's just because of rest. So it's important to find a good doctor to work with, someone who preferably has worked with athletes, if you're an athlete. If you're an everyday guy, you can work with everyday guy, right? And so number two, that foam, foam rolling is my favorite. And I think foam rolling is about twice as effective as stretching. Depending on when you do it, all right? But I like to foam roll first and then stretch afterwards. And then I like to stretch to feel good because when I was younger, and this was the hard part about stretching, I would get into a position that hurt. And now I'm holding it, hurt, 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 hurt. And what that does is just keep, it keeps you from stretching altogether. And so now it's like I find the point stretch. And if this hurts, Right here feels good. And so now I hold this. And then maybe in a few weeks I can get here where this would hurt. Now this feels good. And so I've learned that that is a lot more effective than um, forcing yourself into positions that hurt. Maybe those positions are effective, but they keep you from coming back to performing more stretches in the future. Therefore, I think, you know, foam roll as much as often as you can i don't i don't think you go overdo foam rolling unless you're foam rolling like an, an injured spot if it's an injured spot then maybe you can overdo it but if you're not injured you're just trying to get you know some lactic acid out some tightness out i don't really think you can overdo foam rolling so i love foam rolling and then stretching on top of it but um and ice baths ice baths are mandatory when the lactic acid goes through the roof so if it's just a hurdle workout and I don't really get tired like that, you know, I really don't even got to do two full lap, 
to two lap cooldown, and I'm definitely not thinking about ice bath. But if I run five two hundreds and on that fourth one, my hamstrings lock up. Now the ice bath is almost necessary, like immediately, like as soon as you finish with the workout, it's ideal to get it. A lot of people wait a few hours and they go take it. Like, bro, it's not even your body is cooled all the way down. That lactic acid probably turned into something oily and thick by now. <laughs> I don't know what, what happens with lactic acid, but I've noticed that it's incredibly effective, the ice bath, if you do it immediately, like within a half an hour of finishing your workout. And all it does is, whereas tomorrow you would have woken up with the soreness at a 9 out of 10, now you're going to be at a 5 out of 10. That's it. And some athletes might not notice that difference, and therefore they don't perform the ice bath. But hey, man, what is that? 30, 40 percent? I'll take that all day. And when we're talking about all these small increments that we're always working towards for track and field or any you know, kind of performance based um, athletic stuff, then, then that, that does matter. So foam rolling, stretching, ice baths, if you've pushed the body to where that lactic is just locked up your legs and locked up your muscles. And um, Find a doctor that has worked with, <laughs> with athletes. Rest is more important than anything, anything that anybody could ever do for you. That's my experience. Yeah. And that's super valuable because that experience is not just book knowledge. It's you've actually been living that for years and years and years. So it's practical in the trenches, kind of like, hey, this is just mm -hmm. what I notice works with me and works with my athletes. And I value that much more than any theory or, you know, hypothetical, this is supposed to work. Um, yeah, totally mm -hmm. agree with everything you said. I'm curious, uh, just, you know, you've talked about training, we have talked about recovery. I'm curious how important has, how much attention have you paid to, or do you recommend for your athletes? What's your practical experience around sleep and nutrition? Any tips or tricks for us there? Hey man, if you're fortunate enough to be a professional athlete, you should be sleeping as much as possible. Like when you're done with your, so we will get to the track at 545 in the morning. This is when I was in Los Angeles. And we would be done by like 10, 1030, like four hours. And it's four hours of pain. And really, you need the entire rest of the day to recoup your energy so that tomorrow you can go hard again which is why it's so hard to be a full-time worker and be a full-time athlete. That's what I was trying to do when I, when I met you and I met Carl in Boston. I was taking the train from, I was living in Malden, all right? I was on, I think it was the very last line on the Orange Line, Oak Grove. And I would take that into the city to take, to take the Blue Line up to like Lexington and then hop on a bus so I could get to right in front, in front of my job, right? And then the trip back, and then the trip to Reggie Lewis Center to meet Coach Carl Valley to work, right? And so after, I don't know, maybe a month and a half, my shins felt like they were just gonna rip off the bone because we're at the Reggie Lewis Center and that's a Mondo surface. And we're on that every single day. And of course, at first, oh, I love this surface, it's so fast. But now when you're on it every day, it's so much more intense on your body than, you know, training on grass or, you know, on all weather rubber surface or keeping sneakers on. And so we quickly found that it was overload and it wasn't because I wasn't capable of performing the workouts or anything was too hard. Our body was not getting enough rest. All right. And so I cut that short real quickly. That was. Not long after I got to Boston, I decided I can't do full-time work and full-time track and field. I, I would not have made it to the Olympic Games that year in 2008 had I kept a full-time job. I would not have made it. And that would have been the end of that. I wouldn't have tried competing in 2009 or 10. Or, and we wouldn't have met. You know, none of, nothing would have happened because it just... It's, it's way too much work, way too much work, way too much work. And so if you're fortunate enough that all you do is compete, 
then you should be competing and doing nothing with the rest of your day. You should be lounging and resting because you need that because it needs to be at that intensity level all the time, all the time. We start training for track and field in September, all right? And the championship seasons are usually in June and July, right, and August. And so you're really a full-time athlete when you do track and field. And so it should be rest. My prescription for my high school athletes, because you shouldn't, I don't think you should be working in high school. I'm sorry. Minimum wage to buy what? Like, I think you should stay working until you finish with school because that's not getting you nothing anyways. In high school, you should be concerned with your books and having your fun, right? And so my prescription is sports and video games. So you can stay up out those streets, stay up out those parties. And, you know, when you're playing video games, you're at home, you're on your living room, you're, you're resting for the most part. And I find that that combo works way better than, you know, going and standing up on your feet all day. I've tried it a few times and it's, it's just never worked. Like you really have to be some kind of superhuman to hold a full-time job and go out and compete like at something like an Olympic level, even, even at the college level. I don't even think it's really possible at the college level. You can't, you can't be like an All-American and have maintained a full-time job the entire year. It just doesn't happen because it's just, it's too demanding on the body. And all that happens, like people attempt it all the time. You just get injured. And so you'd never hear the story of these guys because they don't happen because they got injured because it was too much. It's just, it's not realistic, you know, unless you're just blatantly cheating, you know, taking all these kinds of drugs. And of course you can overcome a lot of stuff. If you're doing it natural, it's impossible, man. Rest is like, rest is so important because you make your progress when you rest, you know, just like back to the first one, you start at a hundred, down, down to 90, down to 80, down to 70. You're not making improvements as you're lowering and draining your body of energy. It's once it's recruit, you got that good rest, you got all the good nutrition, all the physio and all that stuff, that it bounces back. And so you get your, your results in the rest. So to eliminate that is to create an illusion of hard work, hard work, hard work. You're not giving your body the rest. And so you think you're doing this cycle coming back up and you're not. Because you're on your way back up and you cut it off by pushing again and not getting rest. And, and so you keep getting back to like 90, right? And then the next session, you're going to get back to 85. And now five weeks down, boom, there's something that's taking you off for two or three weeks. And maybe in that two or three weeks, life happens. And, oh, this happened with the wife or the kids or the family or mom or school. And combined with the fact that I had to take three weeks off because of the injury with this other stuff, too, it's like, let's just let's just try for next season. And that's what happens. That's why we don't hear the stories of, oh, I held this full time job and won this Olympic gold medal because it just doesn't happen because it's just it's too much. And so, hey, man, I'm a big fan of rest, which is why coaching now, because I like my energy is most important to me, my energy. And then time is second for me. And then money comes third for me. And so for me, rest has always been really important. And um, if you're not taking the rest, it's a matter of time. Because you could, you could be on the up and up thinking, oh, I, pff, I'm just unhappy like that. I can just do stuff like this. And you can't. It's just a matter of time before an injury comes. And injuries should put you on a silent for a few days. Once they start putting you on a silent for a few weeks or worse, a few months, now you really need to relook, you know, how it is that you're doing things. So sleep is everything, man. <laughs> Preach. If you're fortunate enough that you can rest, man, and rest up. And if not, it's like, I'm sorry, man. It's, it's so hard to, to do it. Why are you on a full-time job? So. Totally. Train hard, recover harder. Love it. Was there anything that you wanted to add about nutrition in the recovery process? Anything about how you eat, how much, what kind of foods? I mean, no, that stuff is, of course, important, right? I believe it is important. And I, I noticed some things, but not so much. Like the sprint work is going to be more important when we're talking about track and field. 
the strength and conditioning, the hurdle workouts. It's just that like when you're working with athletes, usually they have a different genetic build anyway. Usually their metabolism is through the roof anyways. You know, it's like you can eat an entire pizza and still go out there and perform, not because that's the way it should be done, but that's because you're gifted enough that you're an athlete. You have a system that just burns everything, puts in his body. And so it works for you. And so when it comes to the everyday person, I think diet and nutrition is actually more important than when it comes to athletes. Because in high school, I was peanut butter and jelly and grape juice. That was my diet. In college, whatever there was to eat. After college, I did a whole lot of pizza eating. I've always done a whole lot of pizza eating. So when I when I go on strict diets and stuff, like I guess it can help my overall mood and stuff. Maybe if I was really, you know, keeping track of how much sleep I got and doing all these measurements to see what the actual energy was and all that, maybe I would notice a difference. But for the most part, when you're an athlete, you're going to be able to eat, you know, for the most part, what you want. You still shouldn't. You know, fish is still better than beef and pork is terrible. And, um, you know, it's important, but a lot more important for people who aren't naturally (laughs) going to be athletes. Because if you're naturally athletic, chances are you're going to naturally stay slim. And um, your, your body's naturally going to burn through the um, food. It's important, just not as important as I would like it to be. You know, I mm-hmm. wish I could be like, oh, it's this big, huge change. But I've never seen that. And I've gone on diets. I've counted calories. I've tried maintaining 190 pounds versus 185 pounds. And I don't notice the difference. You know, I don't notice the difference. I noticed that. The slimmer I got and the stronger I got, the better I performed athletically. That's what I noticed. And so, you know, my personal diet is um, snacking. You know, I snack. I don't eat full course meals. I snack. I I get hungry. uh, Go have. I eat a lot of um, pistachios. Have myself a turkey sandwich and cheese and like that's it. And so. I honestly feel that's how the entire world should have their diet is more snacking instead of we got it in our brains that it's three full course meals. And I think that's a bunch of crap. Honestly, I don't even believe in the 2000 calorie standard diet because that's like, once again, cookie cutter, you know, I get by off of a thousand calories and I don't care. I don't sit here and feel like I'm starving or killing myself. I feel freaking fantastic. And so, you know, I think it depends, man. If you got genetic makeup that you're just predisposed to put on a lot of weight, then the diet is so important. But if you're skinny like me or just going to be skinny like me, then you know what? You're not really going to notice the change in diet that much. So that's how I feel about the nutrition. Yeah. I love that because it's, again, it's just real practical advice. And it it is counterintuitive because... The average person listening might think, oh, he's going to say that, you know, vegetables and broccoli, you got to eat your vegetables, which is true. I mean, we all know that you need the micronutrients from vegetables and, you know, whole foods and things like that. But Mm -hmm. what you're pointing out to is that especially high level athletes or people who are training a lot are a whole nother animal. If I tried to feed someone who's doing two, three a day sessions, hours at a time, chicken and broccoli, they're just not going to get enough calories and because they're already a calorie burning machine. And so in the name of health, if I try to give them carrots and peas and stuff like that, um, they're not going to get enough calories and they're going to be malnourished, even though they're eating quote unquote healthy. And that's why you see these real world examples of, you know, multiple time Olympic gold medalist, Michael Phelps eating, what is it like 15 Snickers a day or something ridiculous. And you're like, oh, okay. 10,000 calorie diet. Exactly. (laughs) 10,000 calories. Like that's, that's sumo wrestler diets. Try getting that from broccoli. (laughs) Yeah. And I, and it wouldn't work with me, you know, it works because he's a, he's a swimmer. He oh, has so much endurance for me. I would 
I'd blow up to 205, 10 pounds and I wouldn't be able to run fast. Yeah. And so depends on the sport, depends on the uh, individual. It is vital, you know, for my mother, she's aging. It's, it's very important. Exercise is still more important, I think. So I don't know, man. People say it's 80% diet, 20% exercise. I think it's 80% exercise and 20% diet, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one other question I wanted to ask you on sort of the training and recovery front, because it's both is how important is technique? Cause obviously there's a, there's good biomechanics and there's bad biomechanics to almost anything. Um, and in my experience, you know, I've seen a lot of athletes who don't give much importance to technique or biomechanics, how they're lifting, how they're sprinting, how they're doing things. And they just think, go in there, go hard. Does, you know, if, if I want to squat with a arched back, with a rounded back, if I want to deadlift with a rounded back, it's all just get in there and, you know, throw some iron around. Um, how much of a difference in your opinion, in the training of an athlete does good biomechanics and technique make? Well, I think, you know, it ultimately is going to be everything because you're going to, you're going to come up to an athlete who's just as talented as you. You know, can jump just as high as you, can lift just as weight as you. It comes down to how you execute the movement. And so technique is everything. Like, what changed from me as a 17-year-old high school kid to me as a, you know, a 24-year-old Olympian? It was, it was technique. Same three steps in between hurdles. Same eight steps to the first hurdle, right? The same height hurdles. I learned how to get over them more efficiently by improving technique because technique does matter. And especially in the weight room, you can't get lighter and get stronger without technique. Technique is what allows that to happen, right? Because you can throw around weight, however, you know, with bad technique until a certain point. There's going to be a point in which the weight is too heavy for some link in your body and now you get an injury. And why is that? Because you weren't going through the technique properly. So when you got the technique properly, <laughs> you can push through those thresholds and get to higher limits because things are functioning as they should. When the, when the energy gets produced, it's boom all the way through. And when the, when the system is wrong or the, the technique is wrong, the energy wants to go where it's supposed to and it gets to one point and it has to do a little veer or take a little turn or do something like that. You know, that's how I envision it. And so it's very, it's micro, right? And just these little hiccups, the energy getting where it needs to be. And that's a huge difference when you're running next to somebody, or right? You're going to tackle somebody or you're going to punch somebody in the mouth because you're a boxer. You know, it all comes down to technique. Professionals are professionals because of their technique, right? Because we, we all had talent. All of us had talent, you know, at high school. I didn't have to do anything. I just went out there and won, right? That's how all of us were at one point. And then you get to college and it's a wake up call. College is the first real eye opening because you say, oh my God, that's exactly what I did twice at Fayetteville State Division II. I said, everybody here is just as athletic as me. I was still faster. That's all I had. Everybody was way stronger. And then I got to East Carolina thinking, oh, I'm this super fast guy getting destroyed, right? My first season at East Carolina was just embarrassing. That's when I learned what real hard work was after my first year, because I didn't work hard at Fayetteville State, right? Just thinking, oh, I'm talented, just getting the ball, man. I'm the fastest one here. Just let me do what I do, Right. And so then I get to East Carolina thinking I'm going to do the same thing. Oh, I just got all this talent, man. Just let me go out there and run. Getting smoked. I didn't make conference finals that first indoor season. And now my scholarship is on the chopping block or whatever you say, right? It's like, oh, crap, I'm going to lose it. And so that outdoor season, I kind, of, I kind of picked it up towards the end of the season. And I did enough to get third place at conference. Right. But I still knew that I had to step it way up because clearly I wasn't working hard enough to succeed at this level. And so in year two at East Carolina, I teamed up with the fastest kid on our team. And that's when I finally became a real true athlete. 
And that's when I realized that you have to die in practice. And that's where I learned that everybody on the track team is trash. There's like a few that are really going to go on to compete at the national level and maybe compete at the global level. And it's when you're in high school and you're just walking around, you assume, oh, he's on a college track team. He must be fast. No, most of them are trash because they, they get to the track and they just go through emotions. All right. And so, you know, I had to learn the hard way. All right. And it comes down to at the end of the day, doing things right. Right. I would say that pushing at 100 percent is part of technique. That's 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 a part of what it has to be to get the results that you want. And so when so long as you're not competing in against anybody real, right, you can go to YMCA and dunk on all your buddies all you want. Now you go to a college or a professional team and you probably not even get to the paint because these guys ain't going to let you because you don't know the technique on how to get around when there's somebody in front of you who's just as good as you. And so technique is, technique is ultimately everything. If you're going to be the absolute best, you're going to have the best technique too, right? Serena has the best technique. Curry has the best technique. Phelps has the best technique. Usain Bolt has the best technique. Mike Dent has the best technique, you know? Tom Brady has this, like, you don't become the best without perfecting your craft. And so to think that you can just wing it and just talent your way through is like, if yes, you're going to find out very quickly that it doesn't work like that. Yeah. So yeah, technique is everything, bro. That's awesome. That's <laughs> super motivational. I feel like going out and crushing some sprints right now. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but, I'm not, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, I want to leave people also with one practical thing that I noticed from my time kind of training with you by your side at the track or in the gym with Carl is I noticed that you guys often filmed yourself sprinting and lifting from different angles so that you could review it and get sort of a, you know, a different perspective on yourself. Cause yeah, you can just feel what's happening in your body and try to make it feel better, try to improve it like that. But, mm -hmm. um, I saw you guys doing that a lot and I, I use that in the rest of my own kind of training career where I would feel myself doing my Olympic lifting from the front, from the side, feel myself sprinting and stuff like that. So that's a real practical thing that people can do, which a lot of typical athletes don't do when I ask them, Hey, will you film, you know, five reps from the front, five reps from the side, send me the video and I'll critique it and get, give you some feedback and coaches. I, or one of these apps that help you kind of draw on the video and, you know, check out alignment and things like that. Um, it's really, really helpful to improve your technique. So that's awesome. Uh, I Definitely. wanted to ask you one last question, which is what was it like to actually be in the Olympic games to walk into the stadium with those other best in the world athletes and just be in that environment. What was that like for you? Well, you know, it was awesome, of course, because really it's because it was so hard to get there. Like I compete for team Puerto Rico and it was still hard because you still have to hit the Olympic standard and they set the Olympic standard off the top fifth the previous year. All right. That's how they usually try and do it. Whatever top 50 was, Boom, that's what the standard is going to be. And so that, you know, just the work that it took to get there, you know, was really what made it so great. But um, being there, you know, it was just, it's the accomplishment. It's not about being around all the athletes and all, I don't know. I'm used to being around athletes. And so it was the fact that I'd accomplished what I'd set out to do. And it was just so hard to do, so hard to do. That's what really brought the satisfaction to me. And the opening ceremonies of my very first Olympic Games were on my birthday, August 8th, 2008, because eight is like a, you know, a special number for Chinese. And so we were in, in Beijing, China. And so they decided that they would have so the Olympic Games are going to start on 8, 8, 8, 8. I'll never be able to top that birthday <laughs> that I gave to myself. But um, yeah, that was really really what satisfies satisfies me about it just the fact that it was so hard in getting there to actually make it there it's like ah man i got it for the rest of my life and so you know china was awesome and london was awesome i've been to london before but it wasn't even that it was in the accomplishment you know of something that most people thought was unattainable 
you know, and so that's really what it was for me that, you know, uh, I will always love it. Of course, I still don't got the Olympic rings tattooed on me, but I'm gonna get that eventually one of these days. <laughs> but um, yeah, man, nice. it was a dream come true. And it's, it's, you know, it feels like a lifetime achievement because I, I just feel like, you know, I got it for the rest of my life. Even if I don't do anything else, it's like, I don't know, I feel like kind of like, you know, having a college degree. It's like, ah, oh, once you got it out the way, it's like, ah, oh, I got it. Something that so many people strive for, you know, I got it. And in the Olympic Games is, you know, even that much harder to get. And so, yeah, I love it. That's awesome. That's super inspiring. I, I've loved this conversation. Um, I didn't realize I was going to love it as much as I have. I'm probably going to rewatch this because there's a lot of things that you said that um, are just super practical and super like I can see how they can, you know, I'm not trying to compete in the Olympic Games. I'm a bit old for it anyway and don't have that raw natural talent. But I am interested actually in competing in the senior Olympics. And so when that 55, yeah. 55 year old age rolls around, I'm going to have been training for 30 years preparing and people don't know what's coming. And I'm going to use some of the tips Definitely. that you gave us in this podcast. Yeah, Masters, so, Masters World Champs. Yep, they have yeah. it every year. Heck mm -hmm. yeah, heck yeah. So thank you so much for sharing everything that you've shared with us today. And um, I wanted to know, where can people find out more about you? Where can they, do you have a website, social media, where they can find you? Thanks for having me, Shane. It's been a long time, man. Good to catch up, man. I am at thehurdlemagazine.com. That's what I do. I specialize in hurdles coaching. I coach you sprinters too, but um, it's primarily hurdles. My expertise, you know, I learned a lot. I realized that most coaches still don't really know the event. And so I decided to start teaching what I have learned. And so it's going pretty well. Awesome. So hurdlemagazine.com. Awesome. Hector, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Talk to you again soon. Thank you. 